Oh, hello there. Startled me a little bit. Just working on a few uh, finishing touches. Whoa, to my latest invention here. Just give me a second. Zoom in on the coordinates. Bang. Alright, looks like it should be ready to test out. There's really only one way to see if this is working. A little nervous about it, but I'm just gonna reach out and put my hands on the portal. This wasn't supposed to happen. Where in the world am I? How did my clothes change? Where's my office? Um, what's going on here? Hello, anybody? I sure hope this is working now. I was trying to go back to the time of Christ, but it doesn't look like my time machine wants to do that. So I don't know. Uh, I'm going to keep working on it though. Uh, but in the meantime, while I'm working on it, let me share some of the stuff that I've learned in my research. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. Joseph and Mary had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. A trip of anywhere from 65 to 120 miles, depending on the route taken. Traveling in a straight line, it's around 65 miles. However, it's extremely unlikely that they traveled in a straight line. Mountains and unfriendly people, plus the road wasn't perfectly straight. Traveling on roads tends to be faster, safer, and easier. For comparison, we have several vehicles, all of which are traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Keep in mind that this is all calculated without any sleeping or potty breaks. Also Mary, being pregnant, couldn't travel as fast as usual. If I could just figure out where I was, or when I was, I could maybe figure out if Mary and Joseph had a donkey or not. Or if they traveled by themselves or in a caravan. But as it stands, I'm in the middle, or should I say, middle of a height of some random mountain. And I, uh, kind of wearing some weird robe thing that I've never worn before. All very disconcerting. Um, but yeah, if I could figure out where I was, or when I was, and could get myself to where I need to be and at the time I need to be, I could figure all these things out. But as it stands, your guess is as good as mine. I will tell you one thing though walking on these mountain trails for maybe a mile, maybe, my feet have blisters. I'm a scientist, I work in an office in my spare time I tinker on a time machine okay not used to this heat but I must say this rope thing is pretty cool and so it was that while they were there the days were accomplished that she should be delivered 
And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. So while in Bethlehem, Mary delivered her firstborn. The city was crowded, as I'm sure you can imagine. There were a lot of people there for the census. So many, in fact, that there wasn't any space for them to stay. It was the custom to open your house to strangers. But there were just so many people in the city of Bethlehem that there was absolutely no space left. The classic view of Joseph running around the night that they arrived in Bethlehem looking for some place for Mary to give birth is probably not really true. Kataluma, an inn, lodging place, an eating room, dining room. Used in the King James Version, it's translated as guest chamber twice and inn once. So Joseph looked, but he really couldn't find any place for them to stay. Until he found this. It's a stable. Okay, some place for animals to stay. But really, it's nothing to turn your nose at. Come on, let's take a look inside. When there was no other place to stay, I'm sure this was pretty inviting. Plus, it was private. Mary was going to be having a baby. When you're in that type of situation, Privacy takes on a new level of importance. Plus, as you look around, you'll notice that it's dry. There's a roof on top of us, which is dirt, actually, because we're inside of a hill right now. You're protected from the elements. You know, this is much better than being out in the open in some field someplace. You know? You're safe inside a stable. Much safer than in a random field someplace. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary, and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. Angels are the messengers of God. We don't really know what they look like, though the Bible does give vague descriptions of some angels in a few spots. They are spiritual beings, so they can travel through physical objects and have the ability to appear in the likeness of humans. Angels don't marry and aren't born, so there are no baby angels. And so it was. But the shepherds came and found Mary, and Joseph, and baby Jesus, just as the angels had said. Shepherds were looked down upon at the time of Christ. Being considered incompetent, they were denied civil rights. Buying wool, milk, or even a kid from a shepherd was forbidden because it could be stolen property. The Mizna, Judaism's written record of the oral law, refers to shepherds in belittling terms, at one point even saying nobody should feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. I am really starting to think this time machine is just a terrible idea. I mean seriously, a biker dude? What's the di- why? Just why? Nothing in the code says anything about adaptively changing people's clothing to circumstances, and I'm like five inches tall in somebody's living room. I hope they don't walk in and step on me. <sighs> Tree towering miles above me. I mean, I'm as short as their nativity scene characters. This is terrible. <sighs> I really don't like this one bit. Hmm. 
Something's amiss here. Can't quite put my finger on it, though. Got the stable, Mary and Joseph, baby Jesus, the shepherds, the animals. Wait a minute. The Magi. The Magi shouldn't be here. The Magi didn't see baby Jesus until almost two years later. Here's how I know. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Did you notice the difference in the words, babe and young child? Why would they be translated as such? Well, back in the 1600s, early 1600s, when the King James Version was translated, they were going from original texts, which in this case were in Greek. So to determine what's really meant by these scriptures, we need to go dig back into those manuscripts, look at the original Greek words, look at the translations to those Greek words, and then we can find out what the authors of these two books really meant when they used the words that they used, and we can get an idea of why the translators used the words that they used when they translated it. So let's go take a look at those Greek words right now. Brephos, an unborn child, embryo, a fetus, a newborn child, an infant, a babe. Used in the KJV, it's translated into babe five times, child once, infant once, and young child once. Pideon, a young child, a little boy, a little girl, infants, children, little ones, an infant of a male child just recently born, of a more advanced child, of a mature child, Used in the KJV, it's translated into child 25 times, little child 12 times, young child 10 times, and damsel 3 times. We can further deduce that the Magi saw the baby Jesus much later than the night he was born by looking at some additional texts in the book of Matthew. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Oh, hey guys. I just, uh, pushed those magi into the other corner of the room. I figured, if they don't belong in the activity scene, why keep them here? It was harder than you might think. I mean, I'm only five inches tall. Those guys are as tall as I am, I'm trying to push these things. I'm not really sure what they were made out of. I I kind of thought they were like plaster or clay, but being this small, it's really hard to tell. The texture and everything that I'm used to being almost six feet, just things don't, they don't compose the same, I guess. I don't know. But anyways, as I was pushing them, I noticed something a little odd. There was three of them, right? And you're, okay, so what? There was three men. There was always three. Yeah, but why? The Bible never actually tells us how many magi there were. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down, and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Baby Jesus. Wow. Well, I know what I'm getting him. I've got a time machine. That, it doesn't work right, but... Hey, he's Jesus. He can probably fix it for me. And I'll give him 20 bucks. Standard gift for a baby, 20 bucks. I mean... Okay. I give him the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh and... Plus, I don't have the money. I'm strapped for cash. My time machine uses megawatts of electricity every single day. I can barely pay the bills. I'd give more if I could, but I, I just can't. I don't have that kind of gadge. But two gifts. Time machine and torn down. I just thought of something. I'm giving two gifts, right? Time machine and 20 bucks. The Magi gave three gifts. Gold, Frank, Sense, Myrrh. There could have just been one Magi who gave all three. Or two. And one of them gave two and one gave one. There could have been a half. There could have been a few thousand! And there were just only three gifts that were given, but massive quantities of those three. 
This sheds an entirely new light on the situation. There could have been millions! Okay, I'm probably getting a little carried away. But just because there were three gifts is no reason to think there were only three magi. White Christmas? That's... Yeah, that... the Bible doesn't say anything about a white Christmas. If I'm remembering my geography right, Bethlehem usually doesn't get a lot of snow. Maybe like one snowfall a year. What are the odds that it would have snowed when Jesus was born? Okay, I know. A lot of people like to look at the Romans as being these mean, nasty, cruel, evil guys. And sure, they probably were, but they weren't stupid. Okay, if you're going to have a taxation where you're taxing people that hate you, that don't like that you're ruling over them, you're not going to do it in the winter when weather's bad for traveling. Because there's going to be a greater likelihood that there'll be more people who don't go and get registered for this taxation, which means less revenue for you. You're holding this taxation for a reason, because you want money. So you hold it at a time, even if it's not the most beneficial time for you. You say, these people hate us. They don't want to give us their money. If we hold this thing in the winter, there's fewer people that are going to travel because the weather is bad. So we're going to hold it when the weather is nice for traveling. Even though that might mean putting it off for six months, we're going to do this in the summer. Where the weather's good, people aren't planting their crops, they're not harvesting their crops, they have nothing to do but wait for their crops to grow. And while they're waiting for their crops, they can go to their hometown, they can register for a taxation, they can ta get taxed, we can get their money, and then they can go back and harvest their crops once it's fall. But we got the money. Yeah, we had to wait a little bit longer, but we got it. And that's what's important, because we want the money. The Romans weren't stupid. They had brains, and they used them. They conquered most of the world. They weren't stupid. They were just mean and cruel and nasty. But hey, who isn't? Come on. The entire world of unsaves are mean, cruel, and nasty. That's what life is without Christ. I think we covered all the important topics. I am going to try, and really hope it works, to teleport back to my time machine and get to my lab. No idea how long that's going to take, but I'm hoping at some point to get there. And once I get back to my lab, I'm definitely going to eat something because I am starving. This time machine doesn't take away your hunger even though it magically changes your clothes. Designer who made this thing, what was he thinking? Anyways. Grab a bite to eat, gotta shave, gotta shower. That's really about it. And then, yeah, work on this time machine mark. Try and get these bugs out of the system. Someplace there's got to be some malicious code somebody injected in some of my MySQL database attack or something. But I gotta fix that. And then we will be off to, um, yeah, the next part, which. After his birth, of course, is going to be his life. So, his life and ministry. That's what we're going to be looking at next. As soon as I get this time machine back up in ship shape, and as soon as I get some food in my stomach, and like I said, shave and shower and all that fun stuff. So, I will see you then. Which, for your, your case, will only be a matter of seconds. Me, on the other hand, it could be a few weeks before I get this time machine functioning as it should. But, as soon as it does, I will be back. And we will have some more fun, do some more gallivanting around, and we're going to learn a whole lot more in part two. Hey everyone, got out of that jam we were in a minute ago, actually snuck into a hospital. Yeah, that's right. We're kind of trespassing right now. Don't let anybody know. Um, behind me we got a height chart and an old-fashioned scale. Pretty sure this isn't really used anymore, so I'm not too worried about getting caught. But now that we've covered the birth of Christ, we're going to move on to look at his life. I kind of thought this was fitting. You know, a scale, a growth chart. We're talking about, you know, obviously he's still young now. He's growing up. What more fitting than, like, the children's ward in the hospital? So, I gotta get going. I hear someone coming. I'll be right back. I honestly didn't expect there to be anybody in that hospital. It's old and run down. Maybe it was someone just like me snooping around. Oh, yeah, and I forgot to mention. 
time machine's not working either, so no telling how much we'll be using that. I'm gonna do what I can, but I'm not so sure. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. We really don't know a whole lot about Jesus' young childhood. I mean, the first we read about him in the Bible is when he's 12 years old. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? The temple was a reconstruction of monolithic proportions. It took about 46 years to build. It was made of marble and gold. 10,000 skilled laborers worked on the project, give or take a few. The actual temple building was only about 19% of the entire complex. The hub of religious worship and ceremony for the Jews was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD when the Jews rebelled against the Roman Empire. I've been scouring these manuscripts for weeks and weeks. And there's without a doubt no record of Jesus' young life anywhere. The next I can find about him is his baptism. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John was Jesus' second cousin and was about six months older than Jesus. Luke called him a voice crying in the wilderness. He didn't wear fancy clothes, unless you consider camel's hair and a leather girdle fancy. His food wasn't fancy either. Locust, a relative of the grasshopper, and wild honey. He got the name John the Baptist because of the baptizing he did. Locusts are herbivorous bugs, meaning they eat plants. They have a lifespan of only a few months and can grow from half an inch all the way up to three inches long. Locusts start off as grasshoppers, and then, when their rear legs get bumped around, they release serotonin, a chemical that makes their muscles grow larger, increases their appetite, and changes them into destructive locusts. With the right conditions, they can fly 60 to 100 miles in one day. The first miracle Jesus performed was turning water into wine. I'm going to try and replicate that with a little help from my time machine and this vial of hydrogen hydroxide. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, than that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Miracles go against the established constitution in course of things, 
They break the laws of nature. A supernatural power, God, is behind every miracle. All systems go. All I've got to do is tap on this bright orange button. So, yeah. That went well. I think I need to leave the miracles up to God. I realized as a man, I am woefully unfit for the task. Well, it's a good thing I always carry a broom with me, because this is going to take a while to clean up. See you guys in an hour or two. I've reprogrammed my time machine. Now instead it creates a virtual 3D explorable world. It's going to be a lot safer than the time machine, I hope. A lot less power consuming, I hope. And it'll at least work, I hope. So yeah, a lot of hoping here, but I'm pretty confident in this one. So I know what you're thinking. What's with the dress shirt? No, not trying to be fancy here. Just trying to blend in with the local. Yeah, digital world. There are no locals. Well, that was a waste of 20 bucks. This digital reconstruction of the temple, something like what you just saw when you came to the temple for the Passover. The save, of course, for the fact that, well, it wasn't digital, and it was teeming with people and animals. I don't know about you, but I want to go exploring. So, I'm a catchilla eater. This is pretty cool. To think that I programmed this and it actually works. Never once did I realize how ginormous the temple actually was. Uh oh, it's not a good sound. Segment fault, system restore. No, please wait. No! What do I do? There's gotta be some way, some way, somehow. No, I can't let this restore. It's gonna restore back to the time machine. To the time machine that didn't work, that was all wonky. It's gonna kill me. How do I stop this? No, no. <sighs> what can I do? Coming up. From the other direction, we've got a warm front. Now the two are going to collide. Was thusly moribund. And in other news, today St. Francis has been plagued by sudden disappearances, citizens abruptly changing clothes without their knowledge, and sundry other bizarre happenstances revolving around a young man traveling around the city, and supposedly time, recording himself using a portable HD camcorder. So where am I again? It's a world of white. How do I get out of here? Where do I go to? I hear voices in the distance, but... I see nothing. Just white. A field and a world of white. Ooh! I see one of those goofy portal things. I guess that's where- whoa, 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 whoa. Hundreds, thousands, everywhere, portals. Where do I go? Where do I go? What do I do? Many years ago, about 2000 to be exact, there lived a man. His name was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tiny little man and a tax collector. People didn't really like tax collectors, as they often stole money. One day, Zacchaeus went for a walk. As he was walking, he bumped into a huge crowd of people. He wasn't entirely sure what was going on, but it wasn't long before he did. Jesus was in the middle of that crowd. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but just wasn't tall enough. Zacchaeus really wanted to see Jesus, and suddenly, remembered a tall tree just down the road. He climbed the tree, and not a moment too soon, for the crowd was soon surging past. When Jesus got beneath the tree, he stopped and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. 
Zacchaeus climbed out of that tree just as fast as he could and brought Jesus to his house. Zacchaeus told Jesus he was going to give half his goods away to the poor and restore anything he had stolen four times. Jesus was pleased with Zacchaeus' actions and said, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I'm lost. Again. Stupid time machine ideas. Nothing but a pain in the neck. I don't know where I am. Fortunately, I've got water. I don't know how long this is going to last. I don't know if I can drink that. I look awful. I haven't been to the barber in who knows how long. If and when I ever get back, I'm destroying this time machine. This is terrible. Not at all how it was supposed to happen. Someone must have hijacked my code. They must have. This is just... I don't even know. I'm too mad to even talk. I gotta find my way out of here. Well, that's two fish. Hey, kid. Can you borrow your net? Now what? What the heck, dude? Seriously. Give us the net. Ugh, why don't you go ask some other guy for his net? Be quiet. Give us the net. Fine, gosh, it's at the end of the dock. Have fun fishing, kid. Oh, wait. You don't have a net anymore. Har, har, har. Ugh. Excuse me, sir. Would you like some chicken? Hey, you! I need your help! Those guys stole my toaster! Help! Please! Ugh, get out of my life! Uh Hey, hey, Zar Mavith. Hey, John! I need some bread. There should be some on the counter. Why are you so upset? Ugh, some guy stole my net. Plus, when I get home, my dad's gonna kill me because I only got a couple fish. That's not good. Yeah, I know. Hey, hey, Zamanith! I need some help up here! I gotta go. You wanna come? Whatevs. I need you to wash the front while I put the voles away. Alright. Hey, do you guys have some food I can buy? Food? I've had this stomach ache for the past couple of days, and I hear food is supposed to be good for that. You want some bread? Yeah, give me some bread! Alright, what kind of bread do you want? Like the kind that you eat. You know, you put it down your mouth, and you make you happy inside. Dude, he has like seven kinds of bread. You gotta be more specific than that. Okay, I guess I'll keep looking at it. Oi, I just heard that Jesus is coming here. He's about to show up on the old docks. Did you hear that? Jesus is coming! Dude, who's this Jesus character anyways? He's an amazing guy, he's like healing people from diseases and turning water into wine, and Jonathan told me he has unlimited supply of bacon that he strips anyone who donates to the Jonathan shop. Nice! But what's your point? Don't you see? This guy could totally give me an arm. Give me a break, Hazar Mavis. You can't just snap an arm on someone. That would be like a gorilla with no limbs, and he tried to screw them back on with bananas. Well, I believe he can heal me. Dad, can I go to see Jesus? Well, I don't want you to go by yourself. I need to wash this place. Oh, no. Wait, will you come with me? I guess. Yes! Come on! Hey, Bartholomew, are you okay? Man, Peter, we should have brought some food along. I need a cheeseburger right about now. What's that? Oh, no! They found us. Come to me. Do you see him? 
Uh, indeed, I think so. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wow, he has eggs too. Breakfast at his house must be intense. Come on. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna get my arm. Wait. Master. Hello, young Hazard Meredith. What do you want? Master, I would like to have my arm again. Small boy of great faith, go and sin no more. Bro, don't be that guy. What? Whoa, seriously? You just got, like, a new arm. Yes. Jesus gave it to me. Dude, how'd he do that? Wait, I didn't even say thank you. Uh, can I get through, sir? Yeah, everyone wants to do that. Wait your turn, boy. The master said he wanted us to feed these people. Hey, thirties. What is it, Judas? Do you think the master's going crazy? There aren't enough grocery stores around to feed this many people. Ugh, I just got healed and I didn't even thank Jesus or give him any food or anything. I am so selfish. How could Jesus heal you? Wait, you should give Jesus your food. Whoa, 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 Hazar Maveth. My food wouldn't even make it on the value menu. John, God doesn't care if you give lots of food. He cares about a willing heart. God is using this guy to do his work and he wants you to help out. But how in the world could God use this microscopic amount of food? John, Israel is a small nation, but how do we defeat the Egyptians and the Canaanites and all those other people? Well... God. Indeed, you just give him what you have and he'll take it from there. He can use anybody to do anything. Why doesn't he just create food out of, like, nothing? He totally could, but he wants to give the privilege of helping out. I guess it would be pretty beast to help God out. Indeed it would be. Now come on. Excuse us, sir. Boy, I told you. <laughs> Thaddeus, I'm getting sick of the master's riffraff. Hey, if you guys want, you can have my food. Noob, you couldn't fit a beggar with those crumbs, let alone a crowd of, like, infinity. <laughs> Go and sin no more. Bring the boy to me. What? Is he gonna give each person like an atom of food? Master, here are a few fish and loaves for you to use. Good boy. Wow, they actually felt pretty legit. Was that some kind of a joke, boy? It wasn't very funny. Get out of here, fool. I wanna stay for lunch. Ha! You just gave your lunch away, you little- Shh! The master's about to give thanks for the food. Aw, snap! Shh! Father, thank you for this food you've provided, and for these people who have come to hear your message. Amen. True Amen. Pass the food around. I guess the first one was pretty lucky. Hey, the food's back here. Hey, the food's back here. Mmm! <laughs> I just totally done got healed! See, I told you this would happen. Wow! God can use anyone to do anything. High five me, bro! Indeed. <laughs> Maybe I should have started with a handshake. If I can interject for just about a minute here. First of all, I have no idea what just happened. That was the craziest video, I guess, I've ever seen. I don't know if that was real life or what that was. It was weird. But as I was playing, I, it reminded me of the Bible. And Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the little boy bringing his lunch. So I looked it up real quick on my portable device here. And spot on, it was right. I mean, there was no fish shop mentioned. There were no pirates. There was a lot of weird little things about it. Pink world too. Yeah, I, I totally realize that it matches up with my bracelet nicely though. I don't know. Don't know how it got there. Again, time machine's kind of weird. It just does things how it shouldn't. Or maybe how it's supposed. I don't know. But we'll see what happens. Um, I mean, quite honestly, as long as it keeps playing these weird things that at least are biblical, I, I'm okay with it. I mean, I'd like to be in control and to get back to my lab and all, but it's teaching Bible truths. I can't really say too much against it.
Sure is good to be back. Ah, the lap. Not sure why my time machine couldn't drop me off right here, instead of in the middle of the parking lot. Man, I look like a mess. I need to go clean up. And then on to dismantling the time machine for good. Alright, so step one is disabling the computer. Let's see. Nope. Um, what was my quick quit? No, exit. No, kill. End. Finish. Stop. I don't remember. How did we exit this? Close program? Close. Terminate. Please stop for me. I don't think I made it that convoluted. Well, something pretty neat. There's a universal stop command for Linux based systems. That's what this is. Control C. I believe. Let's try it. Oh yeah! It worked. System is offline. For starters, I'm just gonna unplug a few things. Don't want to let you keep myself here. Pretty sure every tinkerer worth their salt has one of these. Yeah. Looks like a radio, right? Works like a radio. The back side though, secret detonating remote switch. Four stage, there's four switches you have to flip. You have to do them in the correct sequence too. Sends a signal to the remote explosive unit in the time machine. It takes about five minutes for that to warm up. Once it's warmed up, it explodes. So let's see, super secret sequence. There we go. It's charged. It's a bittersweet moment. All the blood, sweat, and tears that I poured in to be gone in about five minutes. It really is pretty sad, but it's what I have to do. It was going chaotic on me. I don't know what happened. But I couldn't let it destroy the world. I'm doing the right thing. After silently weeping for a few days, I got over my sadness and realized I had a film to finish. I pulled together what little money I had and booked a flight. Before I knew it, I was standing in the Holy Land, visa and permit in hand, ready to do some filming. This brings us to the third and final part of this documentary, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. See, Jesus came to this earth to die, to triumph over death and Satan, and to repair the relationship between God and us. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, 
so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Many thousands of years before Jesus came to the earth, Isaiah prophesied how he would come and be killed for us, to take our punishment. This part of the story really begins with the Last Supper. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go, and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entering into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. So Peter and John found everything exactly as Jesus said it would be. Big surprise, right? And they prepared everything for the Passover meal. The Passover was celebrated as an observance of the Lord's passing over the Jews in Egypt when he slew all the firstborn. It was also one of the three pilgrimage festivals. All Jews were expected to travel to the temple in Jerusalem to observe the Passover. The Passover lasted seven days, forbade consuming chemits, and required the removal of all chemits. The Passover was established by God, being the basis for the Hebrew calendar, and occurs on the first full moon after the spring equinox. There were certain specific foods that were eaten for the Passover. Matzah, a flatbread made of flour and water, the Passover lamb, and wine, or unfermented grape juice, depending on who you're getting facts from. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread, and gave thanks, and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Most churches have communion the first week of every month, though they generally read a portion of scripture from 1 Corinthians 11. Communion is just a way of remembering, or even a celebration of the Last Supper and what Jesus did for us in giving his body to be broken and his blood to be spilled in our place. So while eating the supper, Jesus made it known that he knew one of them was going to betray him. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. The betrayal wasn't some last-minute kind of thing. Judas had talked this over with the high priest and had bartered Jesus' life for thirty pieces of silver. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Jesus knew who was going to betray him. He knew when. He knew how it was going to happen. He knew it all. He is God, so he's all-knowing. So when he told Judas, That which thou doest, do quickly. The other disciples had no idea what he meant. Judas did, though, and he left. Shortly thereafter, Jesus and the rest of the disciples left the room and headed out for the Mount of Olives. 
Of course, it would have been dark, but this is how I figure. If it's dark, you can't see this gorgeous landscape behind me. What's the point of coming out to the Garden of Yosemite if you can't see it anyways? And then I figured, well, on the other hand, say I do come out when it's dark. I've got to bring lights, power. I don't know how I would power these really bright, you know, huge lights that don't make noise. I thought generator. I was, <laughs> can't use a generator, it's going to make too much noise. You wouldn't hear me, you'd hear generator. Who wants to listen to generators running in the background to power the lights? So, I just opted inside to film in the daylight when you can actually see the gorgeous garden. Jesus and his disciples frequented the garden a lot. So Judas knew their favorite spots, where they like to go to be alone, where they like to go to talk, where they like to go to do these different things. Judas knew that. He was part of the Twelve. He knew Jesus' habits and what kind of places he went to in the garden, depending on his mood and what was going on. Judas had gone to the temple, where he got a band of men and officers, which he now led to this very place. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth, and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. The character of Jesus really shines through here. He knows exactly what this band wanted, who they wanted, why they were coming. And yet, what does he do? He asks that his disciples may be allowed to go peacefully. We also see the shock of this band of rough, tough guys. They literally fall backwards when Jesus tells them, I'm the one you're looking for. They like fell out of their sandals. They were so surprised. It's probable no one had ever said that before. I mean, come on. You have a band of guys coming to arrest you, ultimately to kill you. Of course, in most cases, you wouldn't know that. And you tell them, oh yeah, I'm the guy you're looking for. Take me, let these other guys go. No, you deny it. You say, I'm not the one you want. You're looking for somebody else. You, you clearly have the wrong person. Yeah, you need, to, you need to find the right guy, but I'm not him. So, tally-ho, and then you run off real quick. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. I learned a few things before flunking out of film school. Uh, anyways, one is every successful blockbuster movie has a high-speed chase. Number two, it's got a pretty girl. Number three, there's a fight scene. And more often than that, there's an additional fourth thrown in for good measure, which is some explosions, some pyro. That kind of fun stuff. Everybody loves explosions on pyro. Well, I thought on this film, I've got one of those nailed. I've got a really cool fight scene. Volunteers these days. Seems they're not too keen about getting their ear cut off. So there goes the fight scene. Sorry, everybody. I was really hoping I could recruit some people from off the street who wouldn't mind coming out here. One with a sword, one wearing a little robe kind of thing, you know, like they were back then, bathrobes. And the one guy just had to cut the other guy's ear off. Easy! Yeah, it turns out not. <sighs> Volunteers these days. What are they thinking? So Malchus's ear cut right off. But it was put back on no more than a minute later by Jesus. Even though these guys were coming out to arrest him, Jesus had compassion on them. And he literally picked up Malchus's bloody ear, put it back on his head, and healed him. If that's not love, I don't know what is. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders, which were come against him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Disgusting, yet beautiful. Disgusting because 
he was holding a bloody warm ear. But beautiful, because even though these men were coming out to arrest him and ultimately kill him, he still had compassion on them. He still wanted the best for them. He still madly loved them. And he still healed Malchus's ear. We need to backtrack a bit. I got a little caught up in the story, and I missed some things. After arriving in the garden with his disciples, Sans Judas, Jesus told them to pray that they enter not into temptation. Then removed himself about a stone's cast and prayed himself. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus knew what was going on. He knew that soon he was going to be tried and condemned, whipped and crucified. His flesh didn't want to go through that kind of torture. So as he prayed, he begged his father that somehow, some way, he might not have to go through this. But as he prayed, he asked, not my will, but thine be done. The high priest's house wasn't just open to everyone. So most of our counsel from John, who actually knew the high priest. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Jesus' trial, if we can call it that, broke numerous laws. But so great was the religious leader's hate for him that they didn't care. Early in the morning, before many people were awake, the religious leaders took Jesus from the high priest's house to the hall of judgment. Now, their actions here are kind of humorous, and we gotta take a look at what John records for us in the Bible. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Do you see that? The religious leaders wouldn't go into the judgment hall because that would defile them. However, the secret trial in the middle of the night that was completely against their law, they had no problem with. Pilate actually had to come out and talk to the religious leaders as they wouldn't enter the judgment hall. He, like any good judge, asked what the condemned had done. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said unto him, If you were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. It's really no surprise that Pilate found no fault in Jesus, being perfect and sinless. Jesus, that is. Pilate was just a man, and a sinner, as are you and I. Pilate wanted to keep the Jews happy. I mean, the last thing any leader wants especially a foreign one, is any reason for insurrection. But ye have a custom, that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? They cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Pilate could have kept Jesus from being killed, but again, he wanted to keep the people happy. 
Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Scourging was performed with a Roman flagrum, sometimes called a flagellum, which is slightly similar to a kettle nine tails. However, the ends of the lashes were tipped with small bone or rock fragments. It was not uncommon for a person to die from blood loss and infection after receiving a scourging. It's said that sometimes the flagrum was dipped in fresh goat's blood being used to promote infection. Roman flagrums could have from 3 to 12 straps. Scourging was an extreme way to get people to tell the truth, or what the torturers wanted to hear anyways. Pilate was convinced that Jesus had done nothing wrong, and was guilty of nothing warranting death. So he called for water, and washed his hands, symbolizing that he was innocent of this man's death. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Pilate had Jesus scourged, but that didn't appease the religious leaders. They wanted him crucified. So, after calling for water and washing his hands, Pilate commanded that it be done as they wanted. Initially, Jesus was carrying, well, more dragging the cross. But after the scourging he received, and the blood he'd lost from the crown of thorns, he physically didn't have the strength to carry on. Crosses were made out of wood, rough cut and rugged. Because they were used for killing people, they weren't made comfortable, because they were made to be torturous. Depending on the age of the wood of the cross, it could have weighed from 1 to 200 pounds. The Roman Empire borrowed the idea from the Phoenicians, who borrowed it from some other group. We're not exactly sure who first came up with the idea. The Roman soldiers pressed Simon, a Syrian, into service and made him carry Jesus' cross. Now, Jesus wasn't the only man being crucified that day. There were two others. And there were also two other, malefactors, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Crucifixion, the cruelest way to die. Nobody was spared from this horror. Men, women, children, and even infants met their death via crucifixion. This was the torture of tortures. Nails were driven through the hands and feet. Though they were placed in such locations that they didn't pierce the bones, but rather went between them, the condemned hung on their nails until they died. Jesus was crucified between two common criminals, one on the left side and one on the right. While hanging on their respective crosses, the criminals and Jesus had an interesting conversation. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Jesus had a sign on the cross, above his head, written in Greek, Latin and Hebrew, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. So Jesus and the two criminals were hanging on their crosses, waiting to die, when suddenly, around the sixth hour, bam, it got dark. And it stayed that way for three 
hours. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they had heard that, said, This man called for Elias. And straightway one of them ran, and took a sponge, and filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after the resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. The temple veil was torn in two when Jesus died, as if torn by an invisible hand. The temple veil separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Only the high priest could visit the Holy of Holies, and only once a year. Records vary on the size of the veil, but Josephus said it was 60 feet tall and 4 inches thick. The veil was torn from top to bottom, and signified that we no longer needed the high priest to make atonement for our sins, but that we could come directly to God. It's funny how the Jews could kill a righteous man, and in the same day, worry about bodies hanging on the crosses for the Sabbath. Anyways, they went and asked Pilate if they couldn't get the criminal's legs broken and have them taken away. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. Breaking the legs of people might sound odd. They're already being crucified. They're dying. Why break their legs? Well, breaking their legs causes all of their body's weight to hang on their arms. This pulls on muscles in the chest, which connect to the lungs, making it difficult to breathe. Essentially, breaking their legs causes them to suffocate and die a whole lot faster. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. This totally debunks the idea that Jesus' bones were broken when he was crucified. They didn't smash his leg bones. His hand bones weren't shattered when they nailed him to the cross. Not a bone of his body was broken. So the Bible says, people, come on. So Jesus was dead. The priests wanted his body off the cross before the evening because it was coming up upon the Sabbath quickly. And there was a man who wanted Jesus' body. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. So Jesus' body was in the grave, and had been all day. The priests and Pharisees were worried that some of Jesus' followers might come and take the body and claim that he had risen, as he said he would. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night, and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went, and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone, and setting a watch. Pilate gave a watch, which is nothing more than a group of soldiers, to guard over the tomb 
Make sure no one came in and stole the body, or messed with the tuning in general. Nobody messed with Roman soldiers. They were the best of the best. If you messed with them, you didn't live to tell about it. The Roman guard was probably 10 to 30 highly trained soldiers. Now one thing you gotta know about Roman guards is they didn't deserve their post for anything. A Roman soldier that put down his weapons, fell asleep, or deserted his post while on guard duty was executed. This is why the Roman soldiers were such a formidable foe, was their strict rules and their complete adherence to their commander's orders. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake, and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. Guys, Jesus rose from the dead. He's alive evermore, seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Death's been defeated. The grave couldn't hold him down. The story of the disciples stealing the body was made up by the priests and their council. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. This video project has been a ton of fun. I'm so glad you guys stick around. But you know what? It's not over yet. After Jesus rose, he appeared to his disciples numerous times. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Before Jesus left this earth to go into heaven, he left us this one final command. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus lived a sinless life. He was crucified and buried, then rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lift up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Well, there you have it, the life of Christ. We've looked at his birth, his life, his death, and finally his resurrection. We've seen how he paid the price for our sins. However, unless you take it to heart, knowing it won't do you a bit of good. Jesus made it clear that there's no way to come to the Father but through him. He said that we had to become as a small child, making it clear that it was absolutely nothing that we could do or have done, but instead was entirely everything that he has done for us. Salvation is a free gift, but like all gifts, you must accept it. Say I have a gift for you. If you don't accept it, does it really do you any good? Is it really even yours? If there is one verse that sums up the entire of the Gospels, in fact, the entire Bible, it would have to be John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. It's really that simple. Just put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Carrying on to the next verse we read, For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God doesn't want to see anyone perish. He doesn't want anybody going to hell. In 2 Peter 3.9 we read this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. However, God won't let the unholy into heaven, <laughs> and we've all sinned. As we read in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Even our good, in God's eyes, is not good. As we read in Isaiah 64, 6, But we all are as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. No amount of our good can ever get us into heaven. God's on another level. And our good doesn't match up. Jesus stepped in and saved us by becoming the payment for our sins. The propitiation. We read in 1 John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So, what's a propitiation, you ask? Well, luckily, we got a really helpful staff, and they left me notes. Round here we go. The act of appeasing the wrath and obtaining the favor of an offended person. Our sin offended God. All of our sinfulness, vileness, and evilness was just offensive to his perfect and holy self. And that's why we couldn't get into heaven. However, Jesus stepped in, took our place on the cross, died for our sins, took our punishment, and he restored that relationship between God and ourselves. And now through him, we have access to heaven once more. If you'd like to talk to somebody about salvation, please call our friends at 1-888-NEED-HIM. Or, alternately, you can send us an email, prayer at thebibleanimated.com.
<sighs> oh, I must have fallen asleep. Oh, Sunday school was. I gotta finish this. Wait. Was that a dream? That was crazy. People don't look anything like that.